Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, EU clusters talk on industrial alliances, joint action for a green and digital Europe is our topic of today. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you for uh, deciding to spend uh, your time, invest your time into us. Uh, today, we will have uh, more presentations, uh, maybe less discussion, but we will have a chance for a discussion as well. So it, it is a bit of uh, a difference in terms of how uh, the cluster stock is structured, but a lot of important content and people who know, uh, who have a lot of knowledge about industrial alliances will be with us. Uh, the European Commission called into life industrial alliances as a tool to facilitate stronger cooperation and achieve key EU policy objectives through joint uh, action. What are uh, the industrial alliances exactly? We will certainly uh, have a chance to learn uh, in greater detail today during this talk. I will just very briefly say that uh, industrial alliances are voluntary initiatives. They bring together a wide range of partners in a given industry or value chain, including public and private actors and civil society. They work to make uh, European economies more resilient, ensure the global competitiveness of our industry, including SMEs, support a successful transition to a carbon neutral continent by 2050 and make Europe fit for the digital age and even more specifically speaking they are created around zero emission aviation raw material solar photovoltaic clean hydrogen batteries circular plastics industrial data and renewable and low uh, carbon fuels so uh, the european cluster collaboration platform on behalf of the european commission organizes this talk and i again welcome everybody and uh, i thank everybody uh, for joining uh, let's move to the next um, to the next slide to see a bit of agenda. Uh, we will learn, we will hear the news uh, from the European Cluster Collaboration Platform. Uh, we will also have uh, six presentations from different DGs, some time for questions and answers as well, followed by funding opportunities as always um, that exist. So that's roughly the agenda, uh, an hour and a half uh, together. And uh, I will remind you of uh, housekeeping rules, uh, as always, as well. We will use Slido to launch polls. Uh, do scan the QR code to answer when it's on the slide, on the screen. Use the Zoom Q&A chat function to ask questions and also the chat uh, function, Zoom Q&A function to ask questions and the chat function to comment or share links and all of the links that will be mentioned during, uh, for example, funding opportunities, presentations, we will also try to put all of them on the chat so you can go to those links directly. If you want to speak, please raise uh, your hand and we will give you the floor. The session is being recorded and the recording will be published on the European Cluster Collaboration platform. That's it, uh, if we talk about housekeeping rules. And uh, we will now hear some news from the European uh, cluster collaboration platform and Nina Hoffman is with us. Uh, welcome, Nina. Me, thanks, Jimmy, and good morning to everybody. I'm happy to be here with you this morning, and let's dive right in. Um, there is an open consultation which is uh, of relevance, I believe, for most of you um, that are connected uh, here today, which is on reporting requirements for businesses and also for member states. Um, there's a uh, this public consultation to find out um, what are actually the reporting requirements that are considered most burdensome, uh, both in terms of time, but also in costs that are associated with them, or um, also for overall difficulty to meet these requirements. And the commission is looking for suggestions for rationalization, modernization, optimization of the reporting requirements to reduce the administrative burden. Um, this public consultation can be answered until the end of November via the Have Your Say portal, and you will find the link in the chat, so it takes you right to this uh, Simplify consultation. So have a look at it, and please reply with your suggestions and with your answers. 
Um, yesterday, the Commission set out uh, new immediate actions to support the European wind power industry. Um, there's a press release uh, there where you can read about the new European wind power action plan that was presented to help achieve the EU target of at least 42.5% uh, of renewable energy by 2030. And it outlines six immediate action areas um, that are accelerating the deployment through increased predictability and faster permitting, improved auction design, access to finance, fair and competitive and innovation, uh, international environment, large scale skills partnership, and of course, industry engagement and member states commitments. So you can read more about this um, in the press release that you click on the link in the chat. You're invited to the Ukraine Green Recovery Conference. This is a full day, four day conference, which will take place in Vilnius in Lithuania from the 28th of November to the 1st of December. Um, it is split into two segments. Um, on the first two days, you will have the policy segment. So this focuses on policymakers and the civil society to set our challenges and address them with policy support measures for the green reconstruction of Ukraine. And then um, the other two days, the 30th of November, the 1st of December is dedicated to business. So you have a circular economy conference and business matchmaking to speak about solutions, to discuss systematic barriers to the deployment of a more circular and green economy, and to connect companies from the EU with Ukrainian um, companies. So uh, a lot of uh, to a lot of ground uh, to cover, of course, for the um, green recovery for Ukraine and a lot of interesting opportunities. You can register for this event via the link in the chat. And of course, we also want to remind you of the next upcoming Clusters Meet Regions events. Uh, they will take place in Germany, Romania, and Poland. You see the dates in the screen. And here at these Clusters Meet Region events, we will discuss the role of clusters in regional economies and as drivers for the twin transition and uh, also see how they collaborate with the regional stakeholders and the governments for the industrial deployment in the regions. In addition, they also offer matchmaking sessions. So if you're looking for new partners, come to the clusters meet regions. And last but not least, I would like to invite you to answer a feedback survey for the ECCP users. Um, the ECCP is looking um, for ways to improve the activities, so you are invited to share your feedback on some key features and its uh, utility, for example, um, on the web platform or on the services um, that are provided. Um, you also see them here on the screen, and they're, of course, all published on the platform. So please, um, until the end of November, or, of course, as soon as you have a chance, um, look into this quick survey, it's uh, really just a few questions, and share your views to help improve the ECCP services. And with that, I hand over back to you so that we can go into the topic of our day, the Industrial Alliances. Thank you, Nina. We will now indeed uh, dig into uh, the Industrial Alliances a bit deeper. Uh, we'll first hear an introduction to industrial alliances, and that will be presented uh, by Sylvia Sekely, who is uh, a representative of the European Commission at DG Crow. Uh, welcome, Sylvia, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. I'll give a very quick overview before I hand over to, to my colleagues. Um, um, as it was also mentioned at the very beginning of this meeting, we uh, by now have eight active alliances. Uh, you can see the list on the slide. I'm not going to read it out. Uh, they have all been launched over the last five, six years. There is just one alliance where you can see the Semiconductor Alliance that is that was launched officially, but it's not yet an operational, it's not yet an active alliance. It will probably uh, become uh, soon uh, active. Um, the alliances, generally speaking, um, are a forum that bring together a very wide range of stakeholders in a given industry and in a given value chain. Um, you can see the approximate number of, of members on the slide. Uh, it will probably also be mentioned by my colleagues. Um, these uh, actors can be 
private but 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 are also public uh, actors in the private sector it is important to to um, understand that um, they come from all over the value chain in a given sector and they are of course uh, the major actors in in that entire value chain but there is a significant share of the members that is composed of micro small and mid cap uh, businesses um, industrial alliances uh, can play a very important role in strengthening certain markets. They identify the needs, the barriers to the development of the relevant markets, identify the actions to overcome those um, uh, barriers. They identify opportunities, investment uh, possibilities. Importantly, they very much help preparing pipelines of viable investment projects and can thus help to create integrated value chains in Europe. Uh, the alliance uh, projects, so these pipeline projects that are being um, set up uh, uh, in the alliances are typically located across Europe. Their deployment indeed plays a significant role in the achievement of the relevant industrial policy targets. Now, um, before giving the floor to my colleagues that are directly involved at the Commission in the management of the alliances, um, I would just um, uh, mention that, of course, uh, based on their dates of creation, they are at a very uh, different stage of their development. So some of them have already delivered a lot uh, towards their objectives, whereas uh, others are, of course, newer and less advanced. Um, and uh, the link that you can see um, on the top of the slide is uh, a link uh, that leads you to um, a web page that uh, shows an, an overview of all of the alliances. And from there, you can get also more information about each of uh, the alliances. I'll stop here and give the floor perhaps to, to my colleagues for more details. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, short uh, introduction. Uh, and as you say, uh, colleagues will present a more detailed overview. So I, I would like to now invite uh, on stage um, a representative of DG Connect, uh, Alexandra Szczesik, who will be uh, giving uh, insights on European alliance for, and alliances for industrial data, edge and cloud. Alexandra, we are all ears. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, so I will start maybe with uh, a small introduction to the uh, ideas behind the alliance that we have. So if I may ask you to move forward to the next slide, please. Um, so we've seen in general that there is a lack of, of this networking um, factor uh, in the industry. Uh, this is something that was very important for us um, when we decided to launch the the, the Alliance for Industrial Data Edge and Cloud. So we wanted to create a stakeholder platform that would strengthen the EU's industrial position, specifically when we uh, talk about processing highly sensitive data. Uh, that is also in line with our um, targets that we have in the digital decade. So in our policy uh, that says that by 2030, we would like to have 10,000 climate neutral and highly secure edge nodes across the EU and 75% of EU business using cloud solutions. So we wanted to bring both the private sector and public sector together so they can uh, talk to each other, but that they can also talk about the possibility of investments because we are not providing per se any investment from the Alliance, but we create possibilities and potential um, relations that could happen between uh, the public and private sector uh, that could leverage those investments and create those synergies between different uh, different players. So these are also in these three pictures uh, that I put here, you see also the more detailed um, uh, reasoning behind uh, our alliance. So indeed the leveraging of the investments, creating of synergies, but also providing expertise uh, for standards and, and requirements, something that is very necessary for us also when we're working on certain working programs, uh, the knowledge and expertise that is being provided to us from the industry and the public sector from within the alliance is very important for us uh, also to uh, to work on a daily basis. Uh, we so far managed to attract 53 industrial members and 27 member states. So we have all the member states on board. Uh, and as you can see probably from the previous slides uh, of my colleague Silvia, um, we are very selective uh, because we work on a very highly sensitive data. Uh, so we might have less uh, members, industrial members, but they're really like the 
the most important players, but also coming from the big companies, SMEs. Uh, actually, the SMEs are the, the biggest representation of all our uh, members of, of our alliance. If I might ask to move to a second slide, please. So here it's uh, it's a little bit from our uh, terms of reference. So if you would go on our website, you, you would read exactly what the alliance is about and what we're aiming to achieve. But here is just to underline once again uh, that we want to bring together a wide range of stakeholders. That's our main goal uh, within the alliance. So we're looking for uh, for this uh, wide range of, of views and, and wide range of expertise from uh, industrial data that could help us boost Boost this uh, investments, but also create those synergies. If I might ask for a next slide. Yes, so that brings us straight to our structure. I will not go super into a detail because I think that it's not really that important for you at this stage. Uh, but we are just basically working within three different working groups. So we have Cloud and Edge Working Group, where we have the representatives of the industry. Uh, this is where the most of our members are placed. Um, they work uh, very often. They meet every second week. Um, they, they work on different deliverables. Uh, the last one that they uh, recently published was the roadmap um, uh, that was uh, relating to the investments in the cloud and edge. Uh, they're still now working on different roadmaps that would be specifying, um, concentrating on different uh, specific fields that were chosen also uh, from the perspective of the interest of those members. We have aeronautic security and defense uh, group uh, that is working on exactly what you, what you see here. And we have the member states cloud cooperation group that is uh, talking to each other, but also they're talking to the cloud and edge and aeronautic security and defense group. So there is a change, uh, exchange of knowledge and, and expertise between uh, all three of those. Mm, alliance Forum is another way of joining our alliance. So if you, for some reason, you're not meeting the criteria of joining the Cloud and Edge, Aeronautic Security and Defense, then you might still join through the Alliance Forum. We organize that twice a year. This is also a platform to exchange, to, to hear from a broader perspective of different actors that, uh, that would like to tell us something that we don't know or where, that we actually should pay more attention to. So that's something that I would also uh, advise you to, to take a look if you're interested in the topic and you see that maybe the Alliance itself is not so much for you, but you would still like to be involved. If I might ask uh, for a next slide, please. And this is the list of our members. So uh, you can see how um, diverse it is. We have members from all the EEA, so not only the European Union, but we also have members from, from Norway, for example. Uh, so uh, this is pretty wide and uh, so far it's, 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 uh, it's really working very well. So if you would like to be uh, to joining our, uh, our group, then please, uh, please let us know. And that's on the second slide when you can see where you can see our website uh, you can see more information about uh, joining uh, the cloud alliance if you're interested so i'm not going to go into detail how to do that specifically but if you have any questions please write to us uh, through this email eu cloud alliance uh, ec.europa.eu um, and we will be more than happy to answer all your questions thank you Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I know that we've still got uh, several minutes with you and then you will have to leave it and will not stay with us for a Q&A later. So if anyone has a specific question to Alexandra, you can type it in uh, now and in the chat. We've still got several minutes uh, and uh, and uh, Alexandra can stay with us for a little bit to, to answer anything uh, that interests you. I before that happens, before anyone uh, asks their question, maybe you could, uh, Alexandra, tell us a little bit more about the Alliance Forum. You say that, you know, if you want to get involved in a different way, uh, do check that out. Uh, so could you elaborate on uh, the Alliance Forum a little bit? Uh, the Alliance uh, Forum. The Alliance Forum is uh, it's an event that we organize twice a year. Um, it, in which we invite uh, all those um, relevant stakeholders uh, that have the expertise, uh, have the knowledge that they would like to share with us on specific topics. Uh, every time we organize the Alliance Forum, we have a certain material that we consult with, uh, with the participants of the Alliance Forum. So we send out the, uh, the material, we wait for the feedback from the consultation. That is also your kind of entry ticket to the Alliance Forum. Uh, so that means that we actually treat it very seriously. Uh, we need some input so we can discuss during the Alliance Forum. Mm, uh, that has happened already twice. Uh, 
So we already received feedback from the industry uh, that was actually pretty useful also for drafting one of the deliverables of the of the alliance. So um, the drafting of the industrial roadmap, uh, where we actually consulted the broader uh, stage of, of players. Um, and we're still looking forward to do that. Uh, we believe that even if you're not meeting a very strict criteria, as I mentioned at the beginning, we still want to hear from you. We do not want to work absolutely outside of the industry. We want to be as open as possible. Uh, so if you if you see that you can provide an input, then 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 please let us know, and then we're gonna be in touch with you regarding next alliance forum that's gonna happen also uh, pretty soon because we um, we envisage that for for December. So uh, that's the time. But also, if you would like to join our alliance and be more involved in specific uh, working group. Um, potentially the cloud and edge working group, then please also let us know. It goes through the assessment and we're going to be in touch with you uh, if you uh, if you get in. And then you will be working directly with, uh, with other companies that you've also seen on the previous slide, uh, where they will be working and you potentially with them on specific uh, industrial roadmaps that we're now um, launching the, uh, the activity in. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I see no... Uh, specific questions to Alexandra. So I think we let her go and uh, and thank you for joining. We will now move to the next uh, speaker, next presentation, a European Battery Alliance, and that will be Matilda Axelson uh, of DG Grow. Matilda, the floor is yours. Matilda, are you with us? Is everything okay? We are eager to hear your presentation and your next uh, speaker on. So I hope that you can uh, join us in a second and uh, we'll speak about the European Battery uh, Alliance. Matilda Axelson of the DG Grow European Commission. We uh, have a link to the European Battery Alliance in the chat as all of the links are also in the chat. So you can access them directly as you go, as we speak, or later after the cluster talk, uh, whichever is more convenient to you. Uh, European Battery Alliance, Matilda, we cannot hear you. Uh, if you could maybe unmute yourself or whatever, whatever works, but we currently cannot uh, sadly hear you. If you could maybe either use headphones or try to reconnect because in the technical test we could hear you perfectly well so we're expecting to hear you soon and uh, before that happens uh, I will just give it a second and uh, we will try to move to the next speaker and try to reach uh, Matilda afterwards I think this is what it will do. And if we can, let's move to Jean-Pierre Lenz uh, of DG Defis, uh, Alliance for Zero Emission Aviation is the topic. Uh, Jean-Pierre, I hope that you can hear us and uh, we will be able to hear you as well. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, hoping it works. Yes, we can hear you yeah. and we can okay. see your presentation. You. Perfect. So, Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so indeed, I would like now to present another alliance, which is um, called Alliance for Zero Emission Aviation. Uh, next, please. Yes. So the alliance was launched by Commissioner Breton uh, in June last year and effectively started, let's say, its work uh, early, uh, early this year. The objective of the alliance is to prepare the aviation ecosystem for the entry into service of electric and hydrogen aircraft. Indeed, today the um, aeronautic industry is developing uh, new um, power uh, technologies, electric and hydrogen technologies to power aircraft. For instance, Airbus is preparing a hydrogen aircraft, uh, medium 100 packs, uh, for, uh, more or less, uh, to be ready by 2035, which is in a bit more than 10 years. Um, we have also a lot of uh, small companies and startup, uh, startup working on electric and hydrogen powered aircraft, smaller one, of course, uh, small, medium, uh, commuter, regional aircraft. So a whole range of new 
uh, electric and hydrogen aircraft are appearing on the market in the in the coming year. Uh, the purpose of the alliance is, of course, on one side to support this investment by ensuring that this aircraft, this development finds a market when they will be ready. And uh, of course, the other one is to contribute, support uh, the climate objective by contributing on one side to the decarbonization of intra-EU flight, because indeed, this technology do not emit when they use green electricity and green hydrogen, they do not emit um, CO2 in the, um, in the air. Um, the range of aircraft are indeed the one which are uh, operating on the intra-EU flight, small, medium size. Uh, this technology is for the moment not uh, foreseen for long-haul aircraft. Therefore, um, for the um, immediate uh, greening and for the long haul, we will need SAF and SAF, so sustainable aviation fuel will be the subject of, I think, of the next presentation uh, because the Commission has so launched an alliance to support the production of this uh, fuel. But if you um, target on, of, on this new technology, so the, the, the objective is the uh, decarbonization of intra EU flight on the medium long term and the emergence also of new sustainable regional air mobility because um, electric and hydrogen aircraft uh, may uh, also um, develop, let's say, a smaller uh, aircraft that can operate smaller route where today perhaps we do not have so much um, of this type of mobility offer. Next slide, please. So the big problem is if today you have, for instance, a hydrogen aircraft at your airport next to uh, your, your, your house, uh, I mean, this aircraft will stay there because there is no fuel, no hydrogen, no infrastructure, no regulation uh, enabling, next please, uh, the operation of uh, this aircraft. So a number of barriers exist beyond the um, researches in development, which is not the topic of the alliance, we, we assume this technology will be developed and certified, but we need to look at all the barriers that uh, would prevent today to have a market ready for this uh, aircraft. Um, you see on the slide a number of those which were identified in a very early um, consultation. We made next slide, please. Now, to, to, to address these barriers, we need to bring together a number of very different stakeholders. We need, of course, aircraft manufacturers, but we need the airports, which are, in a way, the, the key of the, of the market. Uh, we need to have um, operators, airlines. We need to have fuel producers. We need to have the regulator. We need to have the standardization organization, many more. And all these uh, people have to, let's say, work together. Therefore, next slide, we have this decided um, to launch an alliance, which is a, the perfect, let's say, platform to bring uh, all these people together. As it was already mentioned several times this um, this morning, this is the main purpose of an alliance, bring people together to act together. Uh, the alliance, uh, we have already in the alliance one, more than 150 um, participants. The alliance is open to all actors, not only uh, European ones, because the purpose is not here to support directly, uh, let's say, the competitive edge of the uh, European industry, which, by the way, on, in aviation or in the Arctic industry is rather <laughs> high, but rather to um, address the much bigger challenge, which may be the absence of the market for this product. So we need to prepare a market. We need to prepare not only a European market, but a global market. And therefore, the alliance is open to all actors. Um, and you see here the limited number of eligibility criteria, basically to be a legal entity and and then to be committed to the objective of the alliance. Uh, you see on the pie chart that we already have a good spread of the different actors, like manufacturers, airports, airlines, um, energy uh, producer, um, civil society, which is also important, public administration research. So we have, I think this shows uh, that exactly, that was exactly the uh, objective of the alliance, bring all these people together. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, so what are the core tasks? We will we, we, we are in the first phase, which is developed, uh, devoted to the analysis of the barriers and the gaps, uh, including regulatory needs, define the requirements, for instance, in terms of energy, uh, airports, so which airport, which, 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 uh, how, how much energy do we need, and identify actions and <clears throat> recommendations to 
to address these barriers and identify the investment which are required. And from there, we would like uh, to, to prepare a roadmap uh, which um, will present the recommendation and action to be implemented to address the barriers. And in parallel, we would have also to work on uh, promoting investment, which is uh, investment projects, in identifying investment projects, especially at airports, for instance, um, to, and on, on, on the fuel production, how to bring uh, the uh, electricity and hydrogen at airports, uh, what are the investments at airports, um, and, and so on, and foster partnership uh, and maximize synergies and momentum along uh, the, the, amongst the, the actors. Next slide, please. So to, to, to summarize the next step, so uh, when we uh, will finalize the, uh, let's say, analysis phase, um, which will still go on a bit uh, uh, on next year, but first we would like to establish, let's say, the objective, the vision. What is, uh, how does the sector all together uh, with the different component um, see the deployment of this aircraft on the market, uh, especially on the European market, and, um, to define, for instance, the, 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 the need in terms of investment and energy at the different airports and, and uh, per country and per size. Uh, and to provide, and I think this is very important, to provide a common guidelines, a common roadmap to, to support all the different actors doing what they need to do on their side, but in a coherent way, because most, of course, will, will concern private investment um, on energy, on airports, airlines, and so on. But this needs to be, uh, let's say, um, done in a coherent way, otherwise it will, it, will, it will never work. And this is, again, the main purpose of the Alliance, and this is, let's say, the, the foundation, the, the cornerstone of the Alliance. Next slide, the next yeah, one, please. So on, and on that basis, we will uh, establish, as I mentioned, the road map so that should be done let's say um by 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 next year uh the roadmap will also uh, allow us to start a kind of um, monitoring of the progress towards the objective next um and uh, finally uh, as i said we we will also start by by by, by next year uh, launching a number of action and especially in terms of um, promotion reach out and uh Financing, especially uh, probably by launching also a pipeline of project, but before we need to to be sure that the, the sector and especially the airports are well aware of uh, this new uh, move towards uh, clean, let's say, um, um, or zero emission aviation. So that ends my presentation, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much. I hope you will stay with us for more questions. But uh, you, as you said, we're talking about uh, not long haul flights right indeed uh, the, the the technology um today and 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 the, the largest aircraft which is in, in the development is of course by by airbus and they uh, target today an aircraft an aircraft that would be able to perform let's say probably something like 70 percent of the intra eu flight but uh with the first generation of technology, they do not expect to be able to go beyond. Of course, later on, uh, we could expect that the technology will extend to a uh, to longer haul, but that would require a much uh, higher, let's say, for instance, a fuel cell stack um, and another technology would need to be to be developed to 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 um, uh, decarbonize long haul with this technology. So, in this so how, case, how many years do you think we are talking about or how many decades? Is, I mean, again, if we speak about the, the aircraft you take to go on holidays, which basically today would be, if you stay in Europe, a 320 or category or 737. Um, Airbus is working on, 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 on that type of aircraft. Um, and they mentioned the date of 2035, so which is not far. It's 10 years in aviation. Uh, 10, 12 years is, uh, is a short time frame. Um, of course, you will not have uh, hundreds of these aircraft on the on, in operation the first the first year, but from there, um, over the next let's say fifteen years, or I mean in the thirties, uh, you should start. Uh, and we hope, but that's the the challenge. We need to 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 create the market. We need to also ensure that this technology will be um, taken up by the um, operators. But we see that uh, indeed by the end of 
the next decade. Um, again, for this class of aircraft, but industry is also working on much smaller aircraft, regional, short haul, and you know that a number of countries that already um, are developing this technology for, for instance, in the northern of Europe, where they need really a much shorter um, travel distance, but, but because you, you, you know, in the winter it's difficult to reach or between islands it's difficult, so they need a uh, much shorter distance and for those uh, aircraft may be even ready much, much earlier. Thank you so much. Uh, do stay with us. We will uh, try to go back to Matilda again, Matilda Axelson of DG Grow, uh, to speak about the European, European Battery Alliance. Matilda, are you with us? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Thank you. Yes, wonderful. I'm sorry, someday <laughs> over and over again, and it does not. I know anything. it can get exciting. Yes, it, yes, we are very happy to hear you too. Thanks so much. Um, we can jump straight to the next slide. I'm here to speak about the European Battery Alliance and uh, starting off then uh, with that. This is, as you saw in Sylvia's uh, initial um, overview of the alliances, this is the oldest alliance. It was launched in 2017. Back then, we had almost no large-scale battery production in Europe. So the aim here was to, to really boost and energize the, uh, the, the this part of the value chain uh, and to make sure that we have a production inside Europe um, with keeping in mind uh, the store, increased need for storage and also the increased need for batteries for electric vehicles that was forcing them. The um, um, estimation was that we needed to 18-fold our production uh, in Europe by 2030. So um, in, in 2017, one of the first steps was uh, when this became a strategic priority um, was to form the European Battery Alliance. Uh, therefore, since it was the very first alliance, it also looks a little bit different than other alliances in, in terms of practical format, etc. It is an alliance that is open to all kinds of members. We heard that that works a little bit different from the two previous speakers. Um, but the Battery Alliance is basically open to anybody who has who is part of the European battery ecosystem. So you need to be active in Europe, but um, it doesn't really matter if you're active with the raw materials for batteries or if you're an innovation or research center, you're, you're welcome to, to join the industrial network anyway. Uh, in short, a couple of important points. Um, with what looking back at 2017, one of the first jobs for the Alliance and also for the European institutions was to um, develop a strategic action plan on batteries. And this was launched in 2018. Um, it, it contained several key, kind of identified several key problems, as you can see in the figures in the slide here. Um, and these problems were then solved by incorporating different instruments uh, into partially to the scope of the alliance, but also broader, for example, Horizon 2020 and later Horizon Europe funding. So um, just to mention a few of these legs, there's a lot of research going on since this is also early stage. Um, we, we don't have the technologies today for batteries that we will need uh, to decarbonize um, the whole energy system and have the battery production we need by 2030. Um, but another really significant issue in this sector is the skills. We don't currently have the skill set in Europe. We don't have the amount of hands and feet on the ground to, to work in these battery gigafactories. So here there are two different strands. One is the battery academies, which you might have heard of in, in this, the latest um, Net Zero Industry Act. It will contain a so-called battery academy. Um, it is already, the academy is already up and running, but they are now extending this to other sectors. So the idea here is to take the industrial know-how um, and make sure that we kind of through working together with research institutes and universities, etc. Um, we make sure that we are developing master programs for uh, battery production or that we are, for example, um, matchmaking so that the people who have an education actually gets a job afterwards, etc. The academies have a very broad scope. And the second legs on the skills is the All Bats Erasmus Plus Blueprint project, which is focusing a little bit more on figuring out kind of the need, what kind of uh, characteristics do we need to be working in a battery plant. Uh, so the different profiling of the different characters. So skills is a very important challenge that we still, so many years uh, since 2017, are still struggling with in Europe, and it's only going to increase. 
Um, there are also two important projects of common European interest. These are large state aid financed projects. I'm not going to dig into uh, more detail on that today, but it's good to know that these two so-called flagship projects, they are also there to showcase because, again, we had almost no battery production. So when you are in this kind of setting where you might be, be thinking about a, a new sector in Europe, it, it's really good to have a flagship um, that, that, can, that can be profiled as a success story. And in this regard, um, there was another in interesting success factor that has been with us since 2017. Uh, I'd like to highlight that the commissioner, Maro Shevkovic, he was commissioner at the time. He's now vice president of the European Commission. He was uh, the energy commissioner at the time. So he was deeply involved from day one. Uh, since then, he has changed his role. He's become vice president, but he has kept this kind of political patronage over um, this battery alliance. And this has really greatly helped whenever you need to reach a minister in, in a different country or so on, there is this guardian angel uh, from the political side as well. So the political support for the alliance uh, is, is has been very strong from the start. Uh, and this is something that for, uh, I think it, it's a lesson learned that is quite helpful both for different alliances as also for those of you who are working in different clusters to have both the policy side in place, the industrial side in place, and also the political side in place uh, can, can really help. So if we move to the next slide, I will shortly just show you the setup of the European Battery Alliance. It stands on three different legs. The first leg uh, would be the EU and the member states providing the, the, the framework, so to say. I already mentioned the strategic battery uh, action plan on batteries, but um, we have also since 2017 actually launched a battery regulation, which it was published this summer. So, and this is a very, very big uh, piece of regu regulation, which will revolutionize the way that we look at circularity of all types of, of batteries in Europe, uh, large scale industrial ones, but also those we put into electric vehicles. So this is the kind of legislative um, branch. Mm, the second leg is the industrial network. The way the European Battery Alliance is managed is that we actually, we don't manage it inside the European Commission. We manage, it is managed by an external actor, Inno Energy, which is one of the uh, EITs that was, was set up. Uh, they go under the name EBA 250. They have a separate homepage. And this is also the actor that you would reach out to if you're interested in joining the Alliance. So the, the, the Commission side, and the EIT energy side uh, operate very closely, but the whole management of the industrial network is done by Inno Energy, so a separate entity. This also looks different for different alliances, but this is how it works for the battery sector. And the third leg here is the funding and research uh, initiatives. There's a lot that can be said about this in particular. I already mentioned Horizon Europe, but uh, this is also the, all the funding is set up in close collaboration with industry through a battery partnership. So this, if you're interested in funding, um, there's, there's a lot to read up on. You can read up on BEPA and bat for eu for example. All these links are also on the homepage. Um, but I think I will, I will stop uh, there and move to the next slide just to say a few, few words on the industrial partnership. This slide comes from EIT Inno Energy. On my screen, it's not really complete. It looks like some, uh, it's slowly loading, I think. Depending on how big your computer screen is now, uh, you will see that we did, first of all, it's an old slide. It only shows a few different uh, gigafactories across Europe, but from almost no battery production in 2017, at, at large scale battery production, uh, we now have around 30 gigafactories announced. They represent around 70 gigawatt hours, so that is a lot. Um, and you can see if, if you have a good eyes and, or a good computer screen, you see that these are based on announcements still, but we are talking giga scale production, so gigawatt hour per year. Um, none of none of the this transition would not have been possible without the very dedicated actors in industry. And it, the Battery Alliance today has around 800 members. I saw it said 700 in the slide already in the past months. It has surplused 800. 
Uh, I heard the number 850 recently, but I have to fact check that. So the battery ecosystem, it keeps growing. And again, as I said, it has an open membership. So um, there, there are no security issues as such in the battery ecosystem. So don't hesitate to go to the homepage. I will put the link in the chat as well, but EBA 250 um, is where you contact Inno Energy to be part of, of the Battery Alliance. I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Matilda. You will uh, stay with us for a uh, short discussion afterwards. Uh, uh, Alliance for Zero Emission Aviation, we have already covered. We will now move to renewable and low carbon fuels value chain industrial alliance. And this will be presented by DG Move, Mikhail Kubitsky. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I don't know if my slides are so shown. I cannot see them yet, but I think uh, we will now be seeing them in just a second. Yes, so just to sort of go back a bit uh, to the uh, transport uh, and, and, and complementing on to the Jean-Pierre presentation on the ASEA, uh, Renewable Low Carbon Fuels Alliance is uh, closely related in the sense that uh, while the ASEA is looking for a hydrogen application and those that sort of more innovation, more innovative, uh, more uh, forward looking, um, in, our policies need to enable uh, the carbonization of transport modes and those that did not uh, um, sort of started yet, they actually did the, the journey. Uh, and I'm here speaking mostly uh, maritime and, and aviation. Uh, and therefore, we have to look into the solutions that uh, can jumpstart this transition already now. If you show to the next slide, um, we believe that the journey should start from uh, available technologies. Um, and uh, for both of those uh, sectors, uh, aviation and the motorborne, we actually talk about the, uh, um, the technologies that are compatible with existing fleets and stocks. Um, that would most that would be most notably uh, sustainable biofuels, those that are compatible with uh, renewable energy directive, so the second generation and, and um, biofuels and synthetic fuels, which are also hydrogen based, but they are combined with uh, captured uh, um, uh, CO two to create uh, sort of chemically equivalent substances to uh, to existing fuels. Uh, those can be then uh, distributed in existing uh, distribution networks and used by the engines with pretty much uh, limited adaptations. Um, so and, um, that is basically the foundation of uh, why we want to uh, launch the, uh, the alliance, because as you see on this graph, the demand for uh, these fuels is monumental and will be growing in the coming years uh, with the uh, with the progressively um, ambitious mandates from the recently adopted uh, mandates in the uh, uh, regulation from uh, the Council and Parliament, which introduced mandatory quotas both for aviation but also uh, sort of um, uh, in a in a uh, uh, similar fashion for the maritime uh, sector. Uh, jumping to the next slide, so we have created uh, an industrial alliance that is exactly tasked to accomplish this. So building rapidly um, a value chain for supply uh, of those uh, of those fuels. For that to happen, we need to integrate um, all elements in the value chain, starting from the feedstock providers, uh, refineries, and and uh, um, and uh, processors of fuels, distributors, but also uh, those end users that would actually. Uh, uh, use the, use those fuels, so airlines or uh, um, fleet operators or um, ship owners and, and ship managers. Um, that um, uh, calls for the action that um, requires uh, coordinated uh, coordinated investments, and for that reason, we, uh, as a primary tool of the alliance, will establish a pipeline of projects. Um, but there is also a number of instruments that needs to help in supporting of the uh, of uh, the development of the projects, and for that reason, we have set up four roundtables. These four roundtables work on a number of uh, deliverables, uh, 
uh, and if you jump on the next slide, um, these deliverables will be composing what we would call the project development toolkit. We want to help uh, our members to check whether the projects uh, are compatible, whether the technology they are planning to use is visible, whether the, the feedstock that they would want to, uh, uh, to base on is available, uh, and whether the whole economic model is, is, is uh, it may make sense. Um, so the project database and project database will be an interactive tool designed to help design or um, um, improve the projects uh, sort of in their maturity scale. It will be a tool to uh, find partners upstream and downstream, and it will also be a tool to uh, help attract investors. Um, also, with the tool uh, sort of established, we will launch the uh, sort of a money monitoring stage of the alliance where we would want to follow up with the projects, whether they are uh, progressing well, whether they are uh, got the uh, some some uh, some obstacles around the way. Uh, it will also give us a tool uh, to fine tune the, the funding mechanisms that are offered by the EU or the member states, um, because uh, having a tool where we see exactly where are the gaps in the value chain, where is the significant uh, sort of uh, demand for the uh, financing is also very helpful in design uh, of the of these tools. So coming back one slide up, um, uh, we are so far having uh, 223 members. Uh, the call, uh, the membership is a, is a continuous uh, continuous process, so uh, new companies are welcome to join at any time. Um, the limit, we are, uh, we want to create a, a value chain which is integrated with the global markets. Therefore, we are open for our partners, businesses from our uh, key uh, trading partners. Uh, but of course, for the projects, uh, the limitation will be that the projects need to be have an established link with the EU value chain. Uh, we know that the number of uh, sort of especially higher stages in the value chain, we are there. We we continue to depend on the on the imports, and there is not much we we can actually do about it. Therefore, um, we will stay relevant and competitive. Uh, our value chains in that sector needs to be integrated into global markets. Um, so if we jump sort of now two slides ahead. Um, um, yes, our members are concentrated in the uh, in the Europe, but we have a number of members from uh, from uh, from um, global partners from uh, from America, um, from uh, from Far East. Um, we have about half of the stakeholders uh, switch between aviation and waterborne sectors. Uh, mostly, uh, uh, actually, occupy sort of uh, all uh, all sectors of fuel supply, aviation, maritime. These are mostly the and the stakeholders active in the fuel production and distribution sector. Um, yes, so um, I would just maybe on the next slide uh, kindly uh, invite uh, or I invite uh, all uh, the, the clusters to spread the word about our alliance. Um, if there are any um, questions, of course, I will be here to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michal. Uh, last but not least, we'll go to Circular Plastics Alliance. And uh, I hope that uh, Laure Bayarjong uh, of the DG Grow at the European Commission is with us and uh, can uh, uh, present the Circular Plastics Alliance. Good morning, Zedile. Good morning. Yes, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you, if uh, I may say so. So my name is Laure Bayarjon, um, and I've been acting as a secretary to the Circular Plastics Alliance already since 2018. So this is an alliance that was uh, launched in 2018, which is also the year when uh, the European Commission adopted the European Plastic Strategy. So, um, you know, in January 2018, for the first, so the, the, the European Commission adopted the first ever um, strategy dedicated to plastics. Then in June 2018, the Commission adopted um, the, the directive uh, on single use plastics, which was new. And um, in uh, December, uh, it was decided already a bit earlier, but in December uh, 2018, uh, the Circular Plastics Alliance was officially launched. So um, 
all the history of the alliance is on our website. So if you type, you know, Circular Plastics Alliance in your Google bar or any other search engine of your choice, uh, you will find uh, the web page of DigiGrow and you will find the full history uh, of the alliance. Um, I think it was the second alliance that was created by the commission. So it was still early days for alliances. Uh, the first one was the batteries alliance that uh, Matilda uh, presented. So I will just try to give you a bit an overview of what this alliance on plastic has been, um, knowing that um, it has now completed its work program because uh, uh, it was launched in 2018. And um, in September 2019, so nine months later, uh, there was the signature of the CPA, Circular Plastics Alliance Declaration, which included all the actions and commitments uh, by um, the CPA members, we call them signatories. Uh, and actually, of course, uh, 2019 is four years ago. So since then, so of course, the Alliance has delivered everything that they had committed to. So uh, in, that, in that sense, it is a, uh, an, an Alliance that is less recent or less young uh, than um, uh, other alliances that you've been presented today. I think, uh, Zivile, we can move to, to the next slide. Voila, so this is just to give you an overview um, of uh, the, the, the membership. So in a nutshell, uh, I, I mean, not all logos huh, are, are, are here, but in a nutshell, it's really to, to show you uh, that the Circular Plastics Alliance, it is really covering uh, the entire plastics value chain, meaning, you know, from producers of uh, plastics like Cephic and Plastics Europe that you see on the right to processors of plastics that are called plastics converters. So you see EUPC, which is the main association, but you have also a number of sectoral associations, and also to brand owners and uh, uh, manufacturers of final products that you have below um, the below the, the little uh, circle arrow. So you see in automotive, construction, packaging, triple E agriculture, uh, also the, the final product manufacturers are represented to waste collection and recycling that you see on the left and on the top. And what I have put also in this uh, blue box uh, at the bottom of the slide are um, value chain platforms that represent certain polymers. So for example, Petco Europe uh, represents PET, huh? so bottles, uh, trays, and also textiles. Huh? Also textiles is not covered uh, so far in the plastic surveillance. So for example, PCEP, polyolefin circular economy platform, PCEP, represents polyolefins. So just to show you that I would say, you know, in the Circular Plastics Alliance, you have really, you know, the entire uh, plastics value chain and even a bit beyond uh, represented. Um, maybe next slide, Zivile. Yes, also another important, or let's say another basic fact about uh, the Alliance. So the Alliance is really covering recycling and recycled content. So it is called the Circular Plastics Alliance, but there are certain aspects of um, the circular economy for plastics. For example, reuse, uh, reusable plastic packaging, for example. It is not in the current scope of the Plastics Alliance because at the time it was decided to really have a focus on recycling and recycled content to, um, you know, to prioritize this aspect and really uh, help to make progress. So the focus is really on recycling and recycled content, but within this uh, focused uh, scope, uh, the Plastics Alliance has really covered the entire life cycle of a plastic material or a plastic product uh, from recyclability, which is really the first step to then collection and sorting, then to recycling of plastic waste, and then 
to incorporation of recycled plastics, recycled content back into plastics uh, products. Uh, we can move to the, to the next slide, Zivile. Yes, so now, you know, the CPA, what does it deliver? So we could spend, of course, 10 minutes on this slide, but we won't. Uh, the, the, and really, I think what is important is uh, to remember that if you take the initial declaration of the CPA, uh, yes, I think, you know, to be a bit careful or conservative, I, I've put on the slide, it has delivered 90% of the commitments because you can always think that this or that little element was not covered in full in a published deliverable. But I think, you know, the key message is it has delivered its initial declaration. So the, the work that has been announced in 2019 by now has been delivered. So what I have put on the slide for you is a timeline with all the different deliverables uh, that are published on our website. So the, the blue underlined uh, words here are hyperlinks. So when you receive uh, the slides after this meeting, in PowerPoint uh, format, you can click on the links. Anyway, uh, this is also all published on our website. So you have also a timeline on, on our website where you can also click. So uh, you will see um, each time uh, for each of the, of the big milestones, you will see either a press release or a DigiGrow news item or a replay video depending, but so really the, the, whole, the whole information is available online. And what I put also on the slide is, is an idea of how many meetings, you know, this has, this has uh, meant. So, to, so it has been a, an alliance that has worked extremely intensively. And I have to say personally, it was also a, a real pleasure to be a secretariat of, a, of this alliance, really, really a great uh, sector to work with. Uh, Maybe next slide, uh, Zivile. Yes, yeah, so of course, the question could be what's next? Huh? So indeed, the, the, the Circular Plastics Alliance is still you know, active in the sense that uh, there are still emails, uh, some, some members of the Alliance are still un interacting, but of course they are, doing, they, they are doing this, if I don't know how to say, but you know, based on goodwill in a sense, because it's not something that is now written in their initial declaration. So they're just doing it because they want to do it. So, uh, so there, there are some activities that are ongoing. So one is indeed, it's a group of members of the CPA that have created now a brochure uh, with a number of industrial sites, so really like plants, that are offered to be visited by EU policymakers, um, but also national policymakers, and of course, it could well be clusters as well. Huh? So the idea is really to uh, 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 give, a, give an opportunity to people that are not in touch with uh, the plastics recycling reality on a daily basis, but that are still you know, working potentially uh, 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 that, you know, in, in relation uh, to the plastic sector, uh, to give them a chance to, to go and see uh, you know, the reality uh, in very typical industrial plants or industrial sites or very innovative ones. So uh, there will be a brochure uh, and I could see, you know, uh, Zivile, if it can be also shared with the EU clusters uh, network, uh, potentially this, this I will check. So that's one activity, for example. Another activity is a, a discussion, maybe a report in the future, still a bit uh, to be confirmed on chemical recycling. Hmm? Can we agree in the circuit? So, chemical recycling of plastics, huh? which is, as many of you may know, uh, a, a wide a range of different technology. Huh? So, it's not just one technology, it's many different technologies. It is quite innovative. It allows to improve uh, uh, the quality of the recycled plastics really tremendously, or it allows uh, to deal with uh, plastic waste that otherwise is hard to recycle. And so, yes, the, the Circular Plastics Alliance, there is a group, I think almost of 50 members uh, that are you know, discussing together, can we 
you know, can we give a consistent understanding of chemical recycling uh, in this alliance and really share knowledge and insights about it uh, with the you know, broader world? Um, yes, a third activity that is ongoing is on plastic waste collection and sorting where, where there is a feeling that you know, what the, what the Circular Plastics Alliance has published so far is still valid. So there is, there, there is no perceived need in the Alliance to publish something new on plastic waste collection and sorting. But, you know, there is a perceived need to engage with local, regional, sometimes national uh, communities on the importance of plastic waste collection and sorting, I would mention in particular the packaging sector at the moment. And then I put any other ID, you know, the, uh, uh, I think by now the Circular Plastics Alliance has completed its work program, but it is still uh, operational. So it is also free uh, to um, propose some new activities provided that they are within uh, the initial mandate of the Alliance, which is uh, to promote uh, plastics recycling and plastics recycled content in Europe. Uh, so yes, for example, a related uh, activity uh, that may um, come in the future in, in spring is related to uh, agricultural plastics. So plastics used in agriculture, a very interesting topic. So uh, I, I stop here and I'm uh, very happy uh, to take questions. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to encourage everyone to ask questions. Should there be any, you can use the chat option. You can also raise your hand and then we give you the floor. If you have to ask something specific, do that because we roughly have 10 or 15 minutes for this uh, final Q&A session and everybody who is with us still uh, can join that for answering. I just want to ask everybody a rather general question and some of you have touched upon it and most of you have touched upon it actually, but how would you define the roles of the industrial alliances and um, what is the strongest side of them? Why industrial alliances? Why not clusters? Why not some any kind of another uh, unit, what part do they play for innovation, sustainability, and digitalization uh, in the ecosystems is a more technical, more, more specific sub-question, but what do you see the strongest point of, uh, uh, of alliances, of industrial alliances against uh, any other types of similar units? And let's maybe start with you, Sylvia. Hi. Yes, uh, perhaps um, I'll, I'll just say something like general and then colleagues can, of course, uh, come in uh, where they see the strength of their own uh, alliances. But um, what happens here is that alliances are, I think, the only um, uh, forum where uh, you have really uh, the stakeholders of a full value chain for a specific uh, market. You could hear that the alliances that we have are uh, relating to specific um, technologies or very specific markets, uh, sometimes even niche uh, uh, markets. Um, and but the purpose there is really to bring together all the players that are relevant to the full, full uh, value chain. Uh, and indeed, uh, they uh, try to have a very targeted program uh, action plans, identifying the needs um, that are uh, relevant to that sector or to the development of that technology in the EU, uh, and set up the pipeline project. And from there, you can you could see that they may, and that's really somehow the purpose of it, arrive until really a full, um, for instance, IPCI project, which is a full state of project that um, covers several member states and sometimes hundreds of, of uh, beneficiaries and, uh, and um, that would be deployed basically all over Europe. So these are uh, things that it very much boost than uh, the relevant sector and can can enhance the demand also in the relevant sectors so these are specific technologies and and also technologies where there is a specific european policy objective you know we, we didn't have 
batteries beforehand, as you could hear from, from Matilda. And today we also have the last alliance that was created is on solar power. So they are trying to really build up a market there. So I think I, I would um, I would emphasize this really uh, bringing together the stakeholders, all types of stakeholders um, for the relevant sector until they can deploy uh, the relevant pipeline projects uh, to to strengthen that that relevant sector um, in Europe. But I would leave the floor to to my colleagues if they have. Something yeah, Matilda, to add. would you agree? Yeah, indeed. Um, I it, it is hard to. Sorry, you don't hear me. Uh, <laughs> it is hard to. I think everyone uh, uh, actually can switch their uh, their videos, their views on, and we can see everybody. And so, with you know, everybody can participate. So this is just a technical remark, but I think we no longer have to switch our video off. Excellent. Yeah. No. So as as Silvia said, it is uh, hard to measure what part of the success can be attributed to the alliance or not. But in the case of batteries, everybody absolutely agrees uh, of like the import, like the huge importance that the battery alliance has played. Um, on top of this, of course, you need to have dedicated industrial partners and you need to have dedicated uh, you know researchers who are actually applying for the horizon funding um, I mentioned myself the the political leadership and you need to have uh, staff in, in policy making both on member state level and EU level who are dedicated to drive this kind of enormous challenge it has been for the battery sector to go from zero to hero in eight years um, so absolutely I agree with them about the importance of, of the alliances here well, what about uh, aviation, Jean-Pierre? Uh, yes, I think indeed in, in the case of Orleans, uh, by the way, I think you need, um, I cannot switch on my camera, uh, it's on your side. Um, so in the, in our alliance, in zero emission aviation alliance, I think it's, it's, it's very clear that we need to bring all the parties on the on the supply chain. We, we need the aircraft manufacturers, we need the customers, so the operator, the airlines, we need those who are servicing the, the the aircraft, so the airports. We need the fuel supplier. So these are very different stakeholders that we need to bring together, and that needs to, in a way, work along a kind of common roadmap. Because aircraft manufacturers are okay doing research and development, but to launch an industrial project to decide to build the aircraft, they will need to see the market. So they need to see the the, the 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 customers, but the airlines will not envisage buying such aircraft if they see they cannot operate because the airports are not ready. And the airports need to understand that these aircraft are coming and people would like to 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 use them. And we need to have uh, the regulators following because uh, this is a very uh, re much regulated sector, and we need uh, the access to the to the green uh, electricity and the green hydrogen. So I think really this brings together um, many different actors that I don't see any other setup that could could bring for the same purpose these actors together. And then the political reach out because we hope that the alliance will help. Um, the whole supply chain, I mean, the whole the whole um, value chain uh, speaking and presenting their needs and their the challenges with one voice to the um, also to the regulators and, and, and also to the financial world. So indeed, I think this is um, important. Thank you, uh, Michal. What would you say is the strongest point of uh, industrial alliances? And maybe we could already name some success stories and achievements that demonstrate the work of the industrial alliances specifically well it's work in progress so i'm i'm, I'm you know we all trying hard to to make it successful but so far it would be premature to say uh, which were the, the success stories i think the batteries alliance is the biggest testimony which i think we are all ask, uh, looking into um to to replicate it um the key factors, yes, I think it is in in capturing the the attention of the uh, of the high um, uh, high level decision makers, so the very high level at the EU, but also in in, in businesses. Um, I think this is uh, the key component that uh, uh, each successful roundtable should um, alliance should 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 master at. 
um, but also in terms of uh, mobilizing, yes, mobilizing a variety of stakeholders. So that sort of questions maybe the the, the, the sort of the complementary between the alliance uh, and the cluster and the cluster work. Uh, with cluster, at least in my perception, is um, is 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 looking at a um, uh, very focused uh, approach uh, where the alliances need to bridge between various stakeholders. Like in our alliance uh, on, on on renewable fuels, which which brings together maritime and aviation sectors, uh, we have witnessed discussions that never happened before in, in terms of, of of you know colleagues from um, maritime and aviation uh, talking to each other. Um, so. Um, I think that is uh, a power as well on on of the alliances that they they uh, they can bridge uh, build bridges between sectors that being hostile to each other or not really uh, known uh, each other while they are actually sharing share a lot of the same concerns. Laure, would you have anything to add to this? Um, maybe. Um... So in terms of uh, success stories, uh, you know, there are several points. Uh, I think I've mentioned about the Plastics Alliance, but probably the one that is uh, really, you know, uh, uh, close to my heart at the moment is the work that has been done on design for recycling. So recyclability of plastic products, um, where really the Alliance, uh, the Plastics Alliance has identified a number of plastic products, including packaging, for which they have committed to develop design for recycling guidelines on a voluntary basis. And this, this has served as an input to Sen and Senele, who are now developing European standards on design for recycling of all these plastic products. Um, and uh, for me, it's a success story because it, it's a uh, you know, uh, voluntary work at, at its best, really serving as an input for European standards. And because this is very good work, um, ultimately it may also well serve um, to support compliance uh, with future legal requirements, uh, so EU requirements on recyclability. And I think the key success factors there I've been uh, one, uh, the fact that we had really everybody in the alliance, uh, so really the full value chain. And two, that there was also the timing was right vis a vis the regulatory requirements. I mean, you know, especially on packaging, the alliance started to work together, I would say, you know, more or less four years before you know, EU legal requirements may be adopted, which really gave time also to the Alliance to anticipate and to think, okay, what does recyclability mean to us and what can we do together on it? Knowing that in the future, we can expect some legal requirements. So, you know, the perspective of EU legal requirements was probably also a motivational factor uh, for the alliance to work together, but there was also sufficient time. You know, it was not like the requirements were already in place because then it would make it um, a completely different uh, setup. So that's something, uh, yes, that I have been quite happy uh, about, I would say. So as a, a, as an example, yeah. <clears throat> Just to round off, and uh, by the way, if someone has to go, uh, this is fine. We will still stay here for a couple of minutes, but I think Michal has to leave soon. Uh, we are sorry that we uh, have uh, extended this conversation for, for a little longer, but we just want to know, and this will be my last question, uh, if you know any uh, examples, any examples of clusters that are already active in, in your alliances, or maybe if not, you, maybe you have a very clear idea of how clusters can get involved in the industrial alliances? Uh, who could uh, touch upon the clusters factor? Yes, of course. I mean, <laughs> while I'm still here, uh, yes, clusters are very much um, eligible members. Um, those that, of course, can um, de demonstrate that they can be part of the value chain that we are building. Um, they, in fact, we have a number of sort of multiplier stakeholders in uh, in our ranks. Um, so so clusters has been one of those would certainly be very helpful. 
Um, so um, yes, I think that that uh, that sort of uh, experience in uh, in working with multiple stakeholders, multiple businesses uh, can can bring a lot of value. So I would say if uh, if any of uh, our listeners today uh, has in the cluster um, be part of the value chain that uh, provides uh, either equipment or be directly part of the value chain for the manufacturing of sustainable fuels um, is, is very much uh, welcome and invited to, to join our alliance. Thank you, Michal. Anyone else on uh, clusters and how they can look into uh, how to get active in the alliances or maybe you know of examples where they already are? I have just one example in mind, uh, but I'm not sure whether there is a cluster as a member, but there is a, a network of chemicals region, chemicals regions in Europe. <clears throat> so it's a bit, you know, the same approach as with cluster. So they, it's, it's a few regions that have a lot of capabilities in chemicals. So that have joined the alliance because then, you know, plastics recycling could be one of their work streams. So I think that could be, a, it's a, um, ECCM, it's called European. Um, I, I, I can uh, or ECRN, European Chemicals Region Network. Uh, <clears throat> and personally, I think what so we don't have that many network, that many clusters. But <clears throat> I think what can be interesting is to uh, identify, showcase, and uh, and make known uh, really best practices examples on collection, sorting and recycling of plastic waste locally, uh, you know, with an idea of best practices examples that can really inspire also, uh, you know, beyond a certain group of clusters or even just one big cluster working with their region. So that would be probably, in my opinion, what, you, what could be the most interesting. Thank you. Anyone else, any final comments on clusters uh, getting involved in industrial alliances? I would just perhaps add that uh, either you have specific questions on the alliances or you have like more higher level questions, more generally speaking about alliances or or the role that you could play in, in several alliances. I think whether a more horizontal or a more targeted one, we are very happy to uh, to, to also answer your questions, but also guide you to, to the right persons here in the, on the commission side um, for to, to address your your questions or comments. Okay, uh, I would just encourage everyone, uh, encourage clusters to look into how to get active uh, in the alliances. And uh, I think uh, I want at this point to thank everybody for presenting and for uh, giving their insights uh, and for participating in this little uh, debate as well. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, and we will now move to to the next bit, the final bit of our uh, cluster stocks, we will uh, uh, present uh, the um, funding opportunities and uh, finish up very uh, soon. Let's move to the um, to the next uh, bit, please. And uh, for that, I will invite again uh, Nina Hopman to say a word. Many thanks, Julia, and many thanks to everybody presenting their alliances. I believe there are many interesting opportunities for clusters to get involved and to become active. Um, just to share um, some uh, other opportunities as well. Um, if you're interested, uh, there is a call open for an AI data and robotics partnerships. Um, very interesting, uh, also maybe also related to the um, uh, one of the first alliances we had today on uh, Cloud and Edge. Um, the projects here that they're looking for are to uh, create systems to address large scale challenges using combined robotics data and AI solutions, or to address large scale resource optimization challenges using combined AI and data solutions with a deadline of the 19th of March, 2024. This is a Horizon Innovation Action with uh, the topic ID in, uh, here in the screen and the link in the chat. So you can have a look into this uh, industrial partnership to boost competitiveness, in the green transition via AI data and robotics. And there's also a call open um, for the BAT for EU partnership. Here, um, projects are expected to um, comp 
uh, to contribute to um, promoting circular approaches for res uh, resource efficiency in manufacturing so that the European economic base will be much more stronger, more resilient, more competitive, and to be fit for the green and digital transition to advance in circular and sustainable design and business practices related to advanced batteries and the associated, associated value chains to improve the life cycle sustainability performance of batteries to enhance European strategic independence and to support uh, the achievement of the established EU recycling and efficiency targets for 2030. So also very much related to what we've heard of what the Battery Alliance is doing. The deadline for this is the 13th uh, um, uh, of April 2024, and it's the Horizon Research and Innovation Action, where you see the topic ID in the screen and the link in the chat. We would also like to inform you that there is an online info session on the upcoming open call for this trend to be capacity building in less developed regions from the Interregional Innovation Investments Instrument, a very interesting instrument. Um, to look into um, the collaboration across regions. And this info session will take place on the 23rd of November, organized by Ismaya and DG Regio, to let you know about uh, what this call is about and to give you information um, around uh, the application that you need to know. The call will be launched uh, mid-November and it will to have two cutoff dates, um, mid-February and mid-November next year. And you can register for the session now if you would like to attend. Last but not least, uh, I would also like to remind you of the call of the Euro clusters, um, the flagship programs uh, and initiatives where clusters from different value chains and industrial ecosystems are working together to support innovation, the um, internationalization skills and training and to also um, advance in the adoption of processes and technologies across the different ecosystems. So the Euroclusters publish calls that are directed to SMEs and that have a different uh, focus depending on the sector, but of course, all related to the green and digital transition and to improve resilience. Um, you see uh, several calls here on the screen. So if you're, for example, working on uh, digital um, and artificial intelligence, on water smart solution, on e-health, mobility, um, agri-food, uh, textile, uh, manufacturing, there are a lot of calls open with different deadlines. So please have a look at it and to see whether there's anything interesting for your members, for your SMEs, and inform them about this opportunity. And last but not least, I would also like to invite you to the upcoming Cluster Collaboration Lab to work on your project ideas and project proposals, maybe for specific calls you already have in mind, or to network and to create something new. The next one is in Vilnius, Lithuania um, on the 14th and 15th of November with a strong focus on agri-food. Uh, today we're reporting from the Cluster Collaboration Lab in Slovenia, so there's one happening today and tomorrow. And uh, we're looking forward to hear your ideas and to welcome you to this interactive workshop to work on new project proposals. And with that, back to you, Tina. Thank you, Nina. Uh, many people are saying that they need to leave. And yes, we are about to leave too, uh, to finish too. So thank you so much for bearing with us. Just uh, a reminder to register for the next talks. Uh, on the 8th of November, 15th of November, every week, uh, there were stocks and do register uh, next week. Uh, mm, uh, next, uh, The next one to register for is the 8th of November. Uh, and uh, you can see all of the links in the chat as well. Register for the upcoming uh, talks. Do not forget to do that. And uh, also do not forget to continue talking on uh, different uh, networks and on LinkedIn, for example, follow the ECCP website and follow uh, us on social media, European Cluster Collaboration Platform uh, and uh, the LinkedIn conversation is the sort of the newest one and the most uh, active, hopefully. Uh, so do participate there and uh, see you next time. Thank you for your time, which is the most valuable uh, think we've got. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, I mean, thank you for listening and thank you for being with us. See you next time and have a good, uh, fruitful 
uh, an intensive uh, day. Thank you so much. Thank you.